Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm a hands-on software architect and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson 103, we'll actually take a look at what hands-on architecture means and also how to balance architecture with hands-on coding. I'm also going to show you some techniques of how to maintain that technical depth. In other words, how to maintain coding skills and keeping those honed if you're not allowed to actually code besides your development team. When we take a look at this balance, a lot of times architects do not code. And what happens is we focus all our energies in the activities of architecture. And that is creating a logical architecture, identifying and qualifying architecture characteristics, selecting an architecture style, and of course, making architecture decisions. However, we start losing our technical depth. But I've seen also where architects do code, and unfortunately that balance isn't maintained, and we spend too much time coding, especially when we have some challenging code, and now not enough time architecting. So the real trick to being a hands-on architect is being able to strive for a balance where we maintain our architecture activities and that role of an architect while still being able to develop and maintain that technical depth. And let me show you some techniques on how to do this. The first technique really is, and this is when we can actually code alongside our development team. This technique is to avoid being the bottleneck on your team. Your team is just running really smooth until you jump in and start coding and you form a bottleneck. And this has happened to me. This was one of my lessons learned. You see, as the architect, I was able to choose whatever kind of coding I wanted to do. And of course, what did I choose as the architect? I chose the really interesting code, the framework code, the utilities, uh, things that were underlying code that if that framework code doesn't work, nothing will work. Um, I liked doing the infrastructure related code and I, I kind of kept that to myself. I wasn't interested in doing a business development screen or something like this. However, that lesson learned was because I gained a nickname and that was Mr. Bottleneck. You see, the problem is while taking all that kind of code and especially the really hard code, while I was doing architecture work, I wasn't coding. And when you have that kind of code that you're doing, that underlying framework code, people need that, developers need that. And pretty quickly you become the bottleneck on the team. So this was a lesson learned I can convey to you as the first technique. And that is the secret that I've learned, which is a win, win, win situation, is just to maybe Go forward one iteration, two iterations, or take a very simple screen or a simple functionality, a two or three point story, and implement that, something that's not critical. Because if you get too busy doing architecture, it's okay if that slips. And so I usually like one or two iterations ahead. Um, however, three wonderful things happen. First of all, I'm still writing production code. That's a win. But number two, I no longer own the infrastructure or framework code or shared code. And therefore, I'm not a bottleneck on my team when. Also, the team now owns that framework. They understand it and can maintain it. They don't have to rely on me to do that. That's a win. And actually, there's a fourth win. Even though I'm only doing simple coding, I am still coding with that team. And I have not noticed any loss of respect on the team just because I'm doing a simple screen versus some really complex coding. And so that's really the first advice I can give you. But let's suppose that you're not allowed to code on the team or you can't code enough. How do you keep that hands-on architecture kind of skill and, and t technical depth? Well, one of the things that you can do is frequent code proof of concepts. In other words, as an architect, we take a look at modeling different designs. And if I've got a choice between a couple of options, or if I'm not sure this will work, I'm not sure about the, the scalability or the performance attributes, then by all means, code it. 
This gives you two things. This is also a win-win. Not only are you getting exercise and actually programming, and so you keep that current, but it allows you to see the implementation implications of a particular design. I can validate that. I can see two different options and say, oh, well, implementation-wise, that's going to be harder than this option. So I'm going to go with option B. However, here's another word of advice. When you're doing proof of concepts and coding these, unless you know, absolutely know, that this is just a quick little test, I'm going to throw it away, no one will ever see this, write the best quality production code that you can. And there's two reasons for this. Reason one, when you get practice, if you're not coding with your team, writing good quality production code as opposed to really quick and dirty bad code, not a lot. So it gives you that practice. But here's a better reason, by the way. It has been my experience that a majority of all the proof of concepts I have ever done people want to see. And it turns into the reference architecture that ends up in the Git repo. And here's my question. Do you really want the worst code you ever wrote, just a really quick and dirty code, to be your representative example in Git? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> a third technique is, as the architect, just volunteer to take on some bug fixes or maybe address some of the technical debt. Your team will love you for this. I mean, this is a way, this is not critical. So not things that may not have to get done in that particular iteration. But by taking on that technical debt, you start paying that down. Um, but also it frees up the team to be able to work on the core functionality. The same thing with bug fixes. What a great way as the architect of having that practice of root cause analysis and debugging. And so these are two things that you can also do as an architect just to volunteer with. You know, technique number four is one I do all the time, and that is to write architecture fitness functions. This is actual code that you would write to monitor, let's say, measurements of scalability or responsiveness or availability of error handling, of testability. Um, you will see in prior lessons around in the 80s, I think it's eight, lessons 82, 83, 84, and 85, um, set some techniques for actually defining and also measuring some of these architecture characteristics that are important to us. So write those fitness functions. This is a way of actually coding and you're also doing some good. You're creating that observability and measurements within your architecture. Two more techniques. Technique number five, which I've also found very valuable, is write productivity tools to help your team. So for example, um, source validation tool. Uh, there's a lot of things we can't do in tools like lit and tests, like uh, check styles or PMD or find bugs uh, that need to be done. Um, for example, uh, checking validity of SQL calls or checking audit rights or making, maybe making sure you have the right interceptor in place if you have multiple of those. Uh, contract standards, all of these are usually manual checks. And so we can automate some of those things that are on our checklists by just creating a simple source validation tool using the microkernel architecture. This is a way your team will love you for this and you're not taking away from their core job, which is to develop the functionality. There's one more technique I want to share with you, and that is, sounds odd, but volunteer to do frequent code reviews. First of all, you can usually justify this to your manager by saying, look, I have to be responsible for overall code quality, but also ensure compliance with some of my architecture decisions. And so therefore, I would like to do some code reviews. Now, granted that when you do a code review, you're not actually as the architect writing code, but you are involved in code. You are reading code. And that kind of keeps you current as an architect because if you do see some sort of API call or a method call that it's like, hmm, I, want to do, I don't know what that does, now you can research it and keep up with that technical depth. And so what I really wanted to do is share with you some of these techniques 
uh, that I have learned uh, throughout my career as an architect of really trying to keep maintaining that hands-on experience, especially when I can't code. Uh, but again, also being careful not to be a bottleneck on your team. So a couple of resources you can go to, of course, is uh, book Neil Ford and I just recently released in February of 2020, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture, and also my website, developer2architect.com, uh, where in fact these lessons are housed. Um, there's lots of references to books, articles, uh, the QA forum that Neil Ford and I do uh, every month, and also Software Architecture Monday, where the lessons are. And so this has been Lesson 103, Balancing Architecture and Hands-On Coding. I hope you can leverage some of those tips um, in the comments. If you have other tips, please add those. That's the purpose of the comments here, to really supplement uh, some of the techniques and tips that I show. Um, so thank you all so much for listening. Stay tuned in two more weeks for Lesson 104 in Software Architecture. Thank you all so much.